Yeah, we're going live. I'm live. Hello to everybody out there in YouTube land. I hope you were able to join after tonight's episode. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll get you all popping into the room in a minute or two. And uh, you can say hello and let me know if you can hear me okay. Do uh, do go do 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 do. So just as we're waiting for people to transition over from the uh, episode. Hello everyone, so uh, if we get somebody a wee second, these things are always a wee bit funny when we get them organised. We've got a couple of people in there now. Now, Noodles, you're going to have to behave. Uh, oh dear, oh my God. <laughs> hello folks, how are you? Good evening, Sean, loud and clear, and Ryan says it sounds fine. Hi folks, um, bear with me a wee second. We've had to move a room around a wee bit for the doggies, and um, as you can see, one of them here in the corner, this is Holly. But uh, our, my other uh, dog, Evil Noodles, is not too fond of the screen by the looks of it. And I, may ha I think I'm going to have to deposit her. Noodles, you going to calm down? Huh? It's all right, love. It's okay. That's a girl. Well, hope hopefully she'll behave herself. Oh, she's not going to behave herself. Bear with me, folks. Uh, right, here you go. <laughs> you have to stop now. You can be quiet or you can go. You're going to be quiet. Okay, I don't know what it is. It's maybe just because I'm talking to you guys and not paying her attention. <laughs> uh, hello, Babs. How are you? Thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. Um, hope you're all keeping well. And uh, as usual, if you've got any questions for me regarding tonight's episode or or um, or June itself or June the movie or all things June series or anything science fiction, fire them away to me. Um, the more questions you can fire at me, I suppose, the, the more interesting I can make this. Because I'm not too sure who, who wants to put up with 35 days of me talking like this in a row. <laughs> but I do hope you're all keeping well. And um, tonight's episode all about the, the Tleilac Zoo uh, and how their, evolutionary, how their evolution is directed with their technology. And the next episode will go into that a bit more detail, just taking that evolution of the of particular Tleilac Zoo um, technology a bit further. You love the doggos. <laughs> I'll see if I can ask. Yeah, well, they're they're a handful. I'll tell you that much. They're they're both rescue dogs. So, uh, my my dog, the the main the main sort of villain here is Evil Noodles, is her name, and she's the Empress of the Universe, by the way. <laughs> All hail Noodles. And uh, <laughs> and our other dog is Holly Holiday, uh, who we talked about a bit about the other day there. So the uh, one found on a bridge and one found on a crossroads. Um. But there, there are girls, all right. They're, they're a strange pair. Uh, I'm not right, girl. There we are. Oh, yes, indeed. So, has anybody got any questions for me tonight about the, about the video or anything at all? Oh, I don't know if any of any of you seen the film, but um, fire them away. <coughs> Hello, Soup Pot, by the way. Nice to see you there. Thanks for joining us. So, the, the Tleilaxi are quite fun, and um, the, really the dark side of the whole genetic, the whole evolutionary plot within June. And I think what's What's really interesting is them is that we do not see them at all, pretty much in, in June itself. Um, and I, I think they're pretty interesting. Um, there's a few things that you might pick up on. Uh, some things I kind of left out, but again, within the character names, for example, Skytail is, is a type of cipher, uh, I believe. Um, so there's there's we there's we clues to and the way the way that the, the Benny Tylex approach genetics as a as a language of God, I think is quite interesting. The sisterhood of the Ithaca succumbed to the tanks fell straight into the sky tail plan, says Babs. Is that from the old the new books, Babs, or the uh, or the, the last two? Because my memory is really I was saying last night, Babs, my memory is really fuzzy on on um, Chapter House June and Heretics of June. Um, we things that are coming up in this video, as we mentioned them, tend to tend to sort of prompt my memory. Um, but yeah, the, the 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 whole the whole range of things with the with the um, with the Bunny Tleilax and the way they perpetuate and um, the propaganda perpetuate themselves is very interesting. But their propaganda is very interesting. Completely forgot the sky till got this no entropy capsule. Yeah, so I mean, I think that's the the big. The big plot point really isn't it that goes into the last two books is um that we basically have don't we have pretty much every character i think every every person from the june universe i think there's a copy of them in there plus all the uh isn't it all the tleilaxu masters and so on and so forth 
Bernie Jesuit making tanks gave him the tools he needed. Uh, and then, of course, don't they, they ultimately, that's, that's, uh, that's to develop. You see, I think my memory's going to get jogged a lot with the next episode. That's to develop artificial melange, isn't it? Um, so the, the the thing that's really interesting about the time, actually, I suppose, is that it's it's almost a a singular evolutionary path that seems to be undertaken by a, a male element of society that that has imprisoned their female element. More of the Kevin Anderson or Kevin J. Anderson and Frank Brian Herbert books. Yeah, sorry, Babs. Thank you for that. Um, I am. As I said, if we haven't got past the first couple of couple of books, um, you can get the if, if Ethica, by the way, is um, if you get there's a classical reference for you as well. So Ethica is the home of um, Odysseus. Odysseus is the king of Ethica. Um, I sense quite the plot twist there, mm. and we never got to see the, the Frank's payoff. Um, it, it is interesting because he does enjoy bringing characters back. Um, but the null entropy cheat capsule as well. I remember that. I think there's a very good, um, is it a pic, Mark Simonetti picture? Uh, one of the June artists of, I think it's from Heretics of June. If you have a look at it online, it's an excellent picture. And I think it shows you Sky Tail <clears throat> there with the tube. Um, that's what it's a really good picture. So. Yeah, and the, the, there's something we mentioned there tonight. I think it's really interesting that the, the Bene Gesserit wanted, you know, the sisterhood to, to kind of to get together to create a female-only version of um, of the Bene Tleilax. So, uh, uh, the Ethica didn't need it. They had worms. Since we the Ethica. Wasn't a ship called Ethica? I thought something like that, maybe in, in June. I'm not too sure. Um, yeah, so the, the idea that they want the they want to kind of try and create a female version of themselves is, is kind of lines up with the Bene Gesserit's Kwisatz Haderach wanting a, a male version of a, a Kwisatz Haderach is essentially a male Bene Gesserit. Uh, Soupot says, I'm referring to Frank Herbert books, though, Babs. Uh, Bene Gesserit making the tank means that uh, he could use them. So there we go. And, and of course, the whole dependency on on Melange is so that the the, the Benny Tylex are fundamentally tied. I suppose, like a lot of groups within the Jin universe, on breaking that uh, that uh, control um, and dependency that Melange creates within within the human society. Excuse me, one more second. Let's close that over. There we go. Sorry about that. Just closing the door over there. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. So the, the Benny Tleilax are really interesting. Um, there's that kind of, I suppose, play within. We get a lot of the um, Islamic motifs within within June, and I think they're a wee bit more Sufi Islam than, than Sunni Islam, if I can remember correctly. Um, but they're, they're, um, in particular, I suppose, we're up to the point where if we, if we go to June Messiah, I think the... You know the, the entire plot that, that kicks off really is that that sets the Benny Tylax up as as, a, as major players in the game, and um, particularly with the plot to take to take Paul and to control Paul with the use of Golas is very much that plan within plan within plan type thing, and I think there's even you know uh, separate plans around it and externals. Um, the good Neil Reverend Mother Ryan says that all male with extended pranabindu training are Bene Gesserit. Uh, Vamps by us so keeping himself as a gola, saving his own tail. Yeah, it, 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 get, it, it is kind of strange, I think. Um, and I don't know what you think about this, but it, 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 there, is a, there is a point where bringing back characters becomes a bit um, um, hard, hard to kind of take, I suppose. Um, it depends on how often you do it and what the reasons for it. But um, bringing back characters from the dead is never, never a, 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 a good good idea. I think from on, you know, from a literary point of view, and I, I can understand doing it maybe with Duncan Idaho because he was such an underused character. I thought, ah, you you know, very popular. Um, so maybe in, in the realization that it gave him a way to bring another character back. And we kind of get the barn brought back with madness, and then so inside that little null entropy tube of Sky Tales is, is all of these characters who, and I think isn't that pretty much um, 
the way we can see within the, the, the conclusions of the June books is I think we have everyone's there, Paul's there, Chani's there, and we're going to make them all as goalers. So the the, the kind of um, thing with the, the, the Twilight sort of mimesis and ultimately getting to the point where you can't tell a Gola from a human. And um, it's, it's kind of similar to the idea of, you know, the, the replicants and Blade Runner that you can't tell. Um, and it, it, it takes us down that sort of question of what is human at the end of the June universe. And um, I, I kind of always like the opinion that no, I don't know what you guys think about this one. I quite enjoy it, but no, that nobody in the June universe is human because um, all, all the different houses, etc., all, all, you know, um, over thousands and thousands of years reproducing on planets that are different than our own. So having a different gravity would affect how your children are born alone, for example. Um, Sean, what, oh, Sean, so it agrees that fosters nihilism towards investing in what happens to the characters. Suddenly nothing matters if they can just be recreated when it's convenient, so proper territory. Um, and Ryan says the end of the Blade, Blade Runner is the good stuff. It, it is indeed, I think. Blade Runner is fantastic. Um, yeah, Sean, it, it's, it's a good point. It, 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 uh, you know, um, and whenever you get a character, whenever a, a character dies in a story and you've invested, you know, time in that character and you enjoy that character, it, it should be a blow. It should, um, you know, they're, they're, a character's death should mean something. Such things, movies are made. Yes, indeed. Uh, I love the ending of Blade Runner. Uh, in fact, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan. And I, I really, really like... I'm, I'm quite new to Danny Villeneuve's films, by the way. I've checked out a few of them recently. Um, but kind of... Sicario, I think, is one of his, isn't it? But Blade Runner 2049 is really my kind of introduction to it. And I didn't get a chance to see it in the cinema. It, it arrived in our pick movie house, I think, and was out within a week. It was just gone. And... Uh, I totally planned to go see it and I wanted to go online and book a ticket. It was just not there anymore. So I got it on DVD and watched it that way and I thought it was was excellent. Um, Hi O'Neill, Pad Fight. Yeah, Sicario was a great film. I really enjoyed that. Uh, it's a brutal film. It's very good. Um, so, yeah, but the, I'm, I'm a big fan, Ryan, of the of the Android's dream of electric sheep and I'm, I'm very well aware of the differences in, in the stories and so on. But... Um, I have I have the uh, I suppose it's the I have the the edition of the Blade Runner film. It's all the all the different versions, um, and I I'm a fan of the European version with the with the with the, the monologue over the top uh, with the narration by Harrison Ford. That's about, that's the one where he's he's really not a replicant. I think you can't make an argument for it. Um, Rooker Hires monologue is amazing. Yes, uh, all these moments will be lost in time, like tears and rain. I think didn't he come up with that? I think it's it's excellent. He's a really good actor, Rick Gerhard. Um, I love him. He's a lot of good films at the time. Um, they're they're kind of odd, wee quirky films. He's he's very good in the science fiction and fantasy sort of front. If you've ever seen Lady Hawk, that's really good. I love that film. Uh, we've got a bit of movement here. Let's let's just catch up with everybody. Soup pot thoughts on Miles' transformation via Agony Dear. Oh, I I, I, <laughs> um, I like Miles, Miles takes transformation and. and I, I think does it involve a lot of potatoes and carbohydrates afterwards. Um, Miles Teggs, I think the the whole the whole process of following Miles' character. We have an episode on him, by the way, um, just just on Miles Tegg uh, and his transformation. Because um, Soup Pot, as we're going through this, we covered the sort of machine evolutions and then look at how it affects peoples and individuals as well. So we have an, a whole episode on Miles Tegg coming up. Um, and we had to be careful about what we put into this. I suppose we had to pull so much out, but I thought it was really important to have him in as a, we look at different types of quiz at Sadarak. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, do, 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 do. That's interesting about the diversity of humanity on different planets. Originally, the Emperor is meant to be a unifying focal point for humanity, and later that's viewed as a hindrance. Well, well generally, yeah. Um, well, I, I think it is. It's, it's if you think about how just just your environment affects things. Um, the, the the race for Mars is on, and um, uh, let me see. Um, you know who, who is it? Is it Elon Musk? Is it that's heading one, dying to get to Mars? And um, 
I uh, can I ask if I said to you, were you aware of the Ben Reich archetype in science fiction? Would you know what I'm talking about? Because I, I apply this archetype to all of these big technocrats at the moment, and Elon Musk in particular, uh, Jeff Bezos, all of these people, um, include Richard Branson, and, and they're what I call the Ben Reich archetypes. It's the character from the character from the Demolished Man is. He's he's a the main character in the Demolished Man is not the is not a hero he is a villain he's the murderer, and um, is a very interesting character called Ben Reich, and um, I see a lot of this character in these people, uh, but particularly with Elon Musk the race to get to Mars, I don't know we were talking about uh, Stranger in a Strange Land, and I think that science fiction influences a lot of these people including um, chap that runs Facebook etc. And um, I think a lot of them are influenced very heavily by science fiction, indeed. And the idea of getting to Mars first uh, and having a child on Mars um, opens up a range of legal options to that child. And Stranger in a Strange Land covers a little bit about that. But to be the first person born on a planet, then I suppose you own it, don't you? It's yours. Uh, <laughs> for taxation purposes, uh, that, uh, the part of the start of uh, Strange in a Strange Land is it's I think it's four married couples go to Mars and they're all they all own different patents and things for the various technologies and they all end up having uh, affairs and the, the character that's on Mars, the the, the Messiah from that book, uh, Valentine Smith, isn't it? Um, is the product of one of their unions, but you're not too sure which. So this idea of getting to Mars to have the first Martian baby, I think it's quite quite funny. Um, but yeah, but if a child was born on Mars, technically it wouldn't be human because uh, I think it would be slightly different and, and it's be ever so slightly different than Homo sapien or within a very few generations. Those those and if if you would say then that 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 line evolves differently from that on Earth, then it has to be a, it's a related species. But there's a genetic change definitely. Um, Rutger Hauer was magnetic. Do, 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 do. Miles is like combat form. Oh, sorry, hang on. I'm going to back up a wee bit. I've lost a bit of a thread here, folks. Um, Rutger Hauer, suppose, oh, Ryan the Scar, shame on me. I haven't read the novel. Is that Blade? Um, do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? Ryan, um, if you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. And, and um, yeah, it's funny as hell. I love it. Uh, <laughs> I read the first, the opening part of it. So it was not all funny. Sorry, some uh, Dick's got a lot of good humour. Um, I hope that's the book that you were talking about. But it's an extremely funny introduction. Uh, I love, I love the Android stream of Electric Sheep. Well, we'll change your uh, opinion on the film quite a bit. I think the film has altered a fair bit of it. Um, love him too. Sean says he was good in the Hitcher as well. Yeah. Uh, He's good and he's excellent at loads of things, I think. He's got that attitude, soup pot's laughing. Um, will you look into cyberpunk as a genre, says Neil Pad, the philosophy of Nick Land, if you want a deep dive? Oh, um, I did a wee bit of brief work on cyberpunk um, as a genre. It's on it's on one of our history videos on the channel, if you have a wee look, look at it, but it just covers it very briefly. Um, and I don't know how many deep dives I'll be capable of doing, Neil Pad, uh, this all of this work was done uh, between 2006 and 2010, so it, it was done when I actually had access to, to a lot more resources. Um, I assume it's no coincidence the name is Super Jewish. Not sure who you're talking about there, which whose name? Um, first Martian laughing out loud, yeah. <laughs> Valentine's. But well, yeah, it's, it's the fundamental plot point, isn't it? About um, within Strange in a Strange Land. It's kind of about all the different political and religious groups immediately come to the guy and say, hey, sign it all over, would you, son? And uh, um, so we just, well, we've got the name, was it uh, Jubal Hershaw is, is his lawyer, uh, the very famous um, Jewish lawyer, I think, in, in Heinlein's uh, books. I think he's a character that turns up quite a bit. So it's, it's quite hard to explain Strange in a Strange Land, but that's kind of the plot, is that the first Martian ends up back on Earth. People want to give stuff up, and he's been raised by Martians, and he, he needs a lawyer, and, it, and it's a very counterculture weird thing. Uh, first, Astro Engineers influence. Yeah, science fiction, I think, um, uh, uh, very heavily influenced um, with, with an engineering and the, and the technical sciences and so on. Um, well, you'll find the reference there in the first chapter. I wanted to see how popular June really was. This was back in 2006. 
and um, New Scientist ran an article on, on science fiction and its influence on science. It's referenced uh, in the videos. Um, June, that was what we discussed in the videos. June was voted the the best science fiction, the favourite uh, of scientists, uh, because they only called scientists and, and so on. So um, that was quite interesting. The novel, uh, The Android's Dream Electric Sheik, is worth it for PKD's concept of mercerism and empathy. Uh, which isn't in Blade Runner. Both are excellent in their own right, but very different stories. Uh, June is ultimately about conflict of people, religious politics, very apt to today's world. It is. Oh, sorry, Ben Reich. Ryan, I you see you're talking about. Yeah. Yes, indeed. It's a, it's a very loaded name, isn't it? It's an exceptional book, and um, it's a book you kind of need to read a bit carefully. Just the very beginning and the very, very end. Um, I'm not giving that away, but read it carefully and understand it, and then the whole thing is, is bonkers. Um, it's brilliant. Uh, backing up a wee bit, what, what Sean says about mercerism is absolutely correct. And it's one of these Greek mythology things. In in um, in the book, The Android's Dream of Electric Sheep, there are kind of these, um, you kind of get this sense in the films, but it's not explained too much. All the animals are gone. They're dead. And all the humans are feeling massive guilt for this. And the book is called The Android's Dream of Electric Sheep because that, that's what Deckard's going to get as payment for hunting down these, these replicants, these Andes, the androids. <coughs> he wants an artificial sheep as payment. So you get you get the, get the sense of The Android's Dream of Electric Sheep, if you see what I mean from the title. And these Mercer booths are, Mercerism is a kind of religion. And you plug yourself into one of these booths and it essentially is the Sisyphus myth, I believe, Sean. Um, so the, the idea is, um, again, we were talking about the Atreides myth in June. The Atreides myth begins with uh, their familial ancestor who's called Tantalus. So um, Tantalus and Sisyphus, there are particular punishments in Greek mythology and a very special hell called Tartarus, and they're, they're unique to these people. They've got their own special hell, if you like. So um, Sisyphus, is he's always climbing up a hell. And can never get to the top, if you know what I mean. It's, it's a constant, and you know things not going down. So within within, um, so it's an exercise in perpetual futility. And in the in the Blade Runner stories and in the the other stream of electric sheep, people plug into these booths, and they, in a sense, in, in essence, they become Sisyphus, and they climb up these things. But rocks come down, and they kind of the idea is to get further and further to the top of this hill. And they, sooner or later, they always get hit by a rock and they fall down and they come out of the booth. And um, the, the, the essence is that the booth, it's almost like, I suppose, a virtual reality thing, but the injury is real. And it's its its to do with how people, so people go into these booths to kind of experience this taken injury. And it's, it's to do with empathy, but it's, it's, it's to do with their guilt over what they've done to the animals. It's a very interesting book. It, um, the Android Stream More Electric Sheep works on so many levels of beyond and above the film um and it's excellent it's really good and if you, you get a much better understanding of keppel um which is something i'm sure we've all been plagued with for quite some time uh very good very good comments on yeah the mercerism is uh one of those sci-fi religions it's an excellent idea um sean says even jules Verne imagined from the earth to the moon except with a big can instead of rockets yeah the greeks got quite the sophisticated punishments Sophistication is a very interesting word, Ryan, by the way. <laughs> um, to be, you know, um, sophistry and uh, sophistication um, have, a, are, have a very different meaning, word, very different meanings, I suppose, in the Greek world. Um, so sophistication, um, you could argue that I'm an educator, I'm a sophist. And if, if I was in ancient Greece, I'd be both. But technically, a sophist would take payment for his job. It's kind of an idea bandied about the likes of Aristotle that education shouldn't you shouldn't pay that um, the, the educator shouldn't get paid believe it or not teachers shouldn't get paid. Sophia's wisdom yes um, that's correct. So sophistication though so I can educate you or I can sophisticate you. They're two different things. If I educate you, I give you understanding and knowledge. If I sophisticate you, I tell you what you need to say to make it look like you've got the knowledge. So. Um, that's what a sophisticated person. Um, sophistry is any argument whose intent is to deceive. So um, uh, it's they're, they're interesting. So we, we talk about always oh, a very sophisticated chap, isn't he? And we would say that as a compliment. It's not actually. 
<laughs> Artists should be sophisticated lawyers practice sophistry. Um, sophistry is a massive part of, of law. Huge. Um, uh, any argument, and it's, a, it's a part of politics as well, any argument whose intent is to deceive is sophistry. Simple as that. So you're absolutely right. Um, artists should be sophisticated lawyers practice sophistry. Artists should be an educated. I think See, being educated is is um is a, a full on weapon against sophistication. Uh, you can expose sophistication very quickly. Um, all you've got to do is have in, in depth knowledge. A sophisticated person will not. Uh, it's a, it's about um, appearances. It really is. <clears throat> um, interestingly enough, I, I, because Aristotle just disapproved of such things, but he took my he was the tutor of Alexander the Great and he got paid for it. Um, <laughs> Um, you know, it's what. Uh, so there's a few, a few people I think um, these these kind of ancient tutors in a lot of schools in Greek in ancient Greece were like what you would call they're peripatetic. The, the teacher walked around and his pupils followed them, and um, it was kind of like your pupils would feed you and bring you your food and that kind of thing and treat you well. Um, high times have changed. <laughs> Um, there we go, we got a wee bit off topic, folks, but um, uh, scrolling back, I think we, we came in that way from something to do with the Tlaxia, I think, but uh, we were having a wee chat about Denny Villeneuve. Has anyone got any questions? I'm enjoying the crack tonight. Um, fire away. Is June a Stoic saga? Oh, a Stoic. <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't think so. It's far too many things. Stoicism is one of these schools of thought that comes out of the ancient world. Um, Marcus Aurelius, as a Roman emperor, is probably your, your guy. If you want to read something by a Stoic that looks stoical, read uh, Marcus Aurelius's Meditations. Um, uh, no coincidence that lawyers historically have involved themselves in politics and intelligence work. Yeah, well... <clears throat> The, the written word is the most destructive piece of technology ever invented. Um, it's the most powerful piece of technology ever invented. It's also the most benevolent piece of technology ever invented. And it's real. It's first one of its first applications is law. So you'll find lots of these things in the ancient world. And, and laws, laws also apply to religions. So uh, writing is often secret and non you know, you, you can put this writing up and you'll find this in ancient world. We get things on different languages and, uh, and stuff like the Rosetta Stone and so on. But um, uh, no, I don't think so. so I mean, uh, the, the, yeah, I, I actually get why you're coming out of that reason because it's it's all that, you know, put up, you know, hardship and stuff. Um, but I would say that it's, it's not that stoic when you sit on an... <laughs> uh, I suppose. You know, why not? I suppose. Yeah. Sorry, so put my mind was running with something there, but um, I, I would say it's a combination of a few of those philosophies, I suppose. Um, but I'll tell you what, coffee drinking alone would identify it to me. There's too much pleasure in coffee in June. <laughs> I don't know if you get that, but uh, uh, Ryan has made a career, Ryan Holiday has made a career out of reviving the Stoics and has a special translations of meditations he recommends. Uh, June is about the competing disciplines, Bene Desert, Tonics, etc. Yeah, different schools of thought, yeah. And each one of those neo represents a separate, I mean, as much as they're, each of those schools of thoughts are a response to the Bene Gesserit, or sorry, apologies, to the Butlerian Jihad. They're, 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 those schools of thought are, are formed and they're disciplined out of that need um, to let to be in a society with that. So, but each one also, as much as they're intellectual separations, they each become separate evolutionary paths and i think that's we don't really get to see that with i suppose there's other skills but they're things like the sword masters i don't they're not really i suppose some of the skills are that's maybe an example of a physical skill but uh, we, we often talk about mental physical skills um so stoic stoics um yeah i heard somebody talking about marcus aurelius's meditations not too long ago and said it was their bible and that they were a Christian, and I thought uh, the, 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 um, I think it was on the radio here, and um, one of the BBC, BBC Four or something like that. I just caught it out of the side of my ear, and I actually put the two things together. I just thought that's absurd. Um, Marcus Aurelius enjoyed. Well, he didn't. I don't know if he enjoyed it, but he sold a lot of Christians into bags with dogs and stuff. He persecuted the Christians quite badly. He's not a friend of Christianity. Um, so though, um, 
I, I, there's elements of stoicism in it, definitely. So, so but, <clears throat> um, but I wouldn't think it runs all the way, and I, I wouldn't. I would argue that the the God Emperor. So I'd say Marcus Aurelius is a Stoic, absolutely. But um, and his writings are part of that. But uh, but the God Emperor is most certainly not a Stoic, uh, not in any way. Um, coffee is life, damn it. Here, I actually wanted to ask you guys something because maybe somebody can tell me this um, because I know a lot of you are in America and I love coffee and I always say I'd love a nice cup of joe and I understand that that's an American saying but I was, I was just thinking about it the other day. Where, do, where does that originate? If anybody could tell me, I'd love to know. It's just one of those little bits of trivia that I've been dying to know. John Taylor Gatto recommends three classics for elite education as well, including meditations. The other two are Caesar's Gaelic Wars and uh, Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan, Gaelic Wars. Uh, Caesar's, um, Caesar's are campions in Gaul. Um, yeah, I've got, I've got, uh, I've got the Caesar's uh, that here. Um, for elite recommend education, I think that's absurd. Um, are we heading that way towards anti-technology revolution? Do we think it's quite possible? Um, you're all probably wondering why is an XIT sort of lecture that I have been having a bit of bother trying to figure out some YouTube stuff and things like that. And it's because I have not gone near a lot of things. I'm, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm a bit tech, technology, as they say in, in, in the Blade Runner film, it's either a benefit or a hazard. But um, it, yeah, it's a tech, the level of intrusion, I think, by, by government at the moment is quite bad. Uh, and by, by big business, businesses, um, but it's the level of intrusion that we allow them to have. Um, Ted Kaczynski may not have been wrong, even if his methods were Ted Kaczynski's. Don't know the name, sorry. Oh, that's at Neil Padfa. Sorry, uh, Sean. Uh, we've got, we got a bit about John Taylor Gamera with three classics for meditation. Tom's, Tom's Leviathan. Again. See, books like this, what, what, what is it that makes them elitist? Um, I don't know. But simply put, I've always thought as a book is a book. And um, I'm working class, whatever that means. Um, uh, yes, this is a fascinating guy just reading his industry books, his new part. Coffee is the juice of Safu. Yeah, that's what I've always called it, uh, called it, uh, Sean. It was the juice, it gets me, I can't function without a cup of coffee in the morning. One sip and I'm wide awake, but without it, I'm a zombie. Mm. Pardon me. So, just um, there, there are loads of books. I mean, it's books like Leviathan, but there, there are books that stand out throughout history, and they don't need to, you don't need to kind of get anybody's advice on the kind of, I, I mean, I read stuff like, um, and I find this in a library, and I go, oh, that looks interesting. What's this? Uh, you know, things like uh, Gargantua and Pantocrow. Um, you, you find all sorts of wonderful things. I can, I can tell you something last night. I watched last night was, um, I think it's on Amazon is uh is it Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. And it's based on the on the, the poem, the Arthurian poem, which I have here. And I, I it's a it's a it's a beautiful film and it's a my wife thought it was quite boring and slow, but I, I thought it was a very pretty film. And I, I very much enjoyed it. And I and it, it's, it's a, there's bits of that poem missing actually. So I think it gave the film director a little bit of a chance to play around with it without without losing too much integrity of the of the original story. And uh, it's uh, it was it's pretty good actually because the, the last time I'd seen somebody try to make a film out of something like that, <coughs> excuse me, it was a Sean Connery film about Sword of the Valiant. Is that it about Sir, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight? It's one of the worst films ever, I think, in my own opinion. <laughs> but a book is a book, and it's um, anyone can educate themselves from books as long as you can read um, or you can listen to. There's so many ways of absorbing information these days. But I, I, I just of interest things. Certain books do stand out throughout time. They're, they're of interest, and uh, you know things, even things like Dante's Inferno. It's, uh, but even at the time you should hit secondary school, you should have heard of it at the very least. You know, um, I have seen Colin Joe was from World War Two trips. Colin Joe, I was wondering, is it just that? Yeah, thank you very much, but uh, but it's, it's a great way. I, I just wish more people over here understood what I meant. I think I, my understanding is if you ask for a cup of joe in America, you get a cup of coffee like that, no bother. And it's just a phrase that I picked up a long time ago, and I always ask people for a cup of joe, and then I go, coffee, please. <laughs> That's one of those things. Um, it's very hard to get a decent cup of coffee here. Everything's like a half-calf, double-decaf, 
froth a latte with a twist of lemon or something. It's, it's terrible. Um, there we go. Has anyone got any questions for me? Far, far away. We're, we're, we're on Philip K. Dick and um, I suppose the elitism of, of uh, some forms of literature. Um, the, do you know what? I think th this is the problem for a lot of aspects of society is that elitism is about control of knowledge control of even for a long time if you think about how many people could read and write in a country like for example where i'm at 100 years ago it's not that many um control of language uh, and also that the you can still see this the way today some dead some religions use dead languages to to create mystique you know um and that, that's all part of it i suppose um can't be blank no frills ah well i like a wee bit a couple of sweeteners and a dash of milk but i'm happy with it black uh, but it's it's the not not flavoured in any way, if you know what I mean. College was also a SCP. What well, was that SCP? Can you get? Can you expand your acronym for me, Ryan? I'm not too sure what SCP means. Cup of Joe is also. I'm I'm I'm, <laughs> I'm very very curious to find it. SCP, what could that be? Social something? No, well, yes, it could be ask it. I'm wondering what that stands for. Sorry, mate. Uh, a lot of this with the plans within plans in the Jin universe. Yeah, organizations of humans as systems to be managed by elites, like an ecology. And the opposite. So, how do we start the Butlerian Jihad? Um, <laughs> start building EMP devices. I'll get you there. <laughs> uh, um, Organising humans as systems to be managed by elites. Yeah, like an ecology. The the whole thing with systemic thinking and ecological thinking, part of systems, and that's a bit of a big part of that later on, really, with the ecology chapter, Sean. Um, and you. you Systemic thinking is one of Frank's sort of schizophrenic warnings, I think. Um, and I think you're you're an IT guy, I think, Sean, so you, you understand systems. Um, my, my IT skills are systems heavy. So uh, my, my degree is computers and information systems. Um, and you can, you can, systems are, you can make systems out of anything. You can create them yourself and apply them to pretty much up to and including the entire universe. Um, and beyond. SC, SCP Foundation deals with abnormal entities. Oh, I'm on the wiser. <laughs> uh, uh, again, I don't have definitions of entities and all that, etc. But abnormal. That's the old, what's abby normal? <laughs> what's abnormal? And what, yeah, but what kind of entities? Uh, uh, I'm going to have to look this up, aren't I? Um, but what does the SCP stand for, Ryan? That's kind of what I wanted to know. They're a foundation who deal with, they sound like BP, does it? Bureau of BPRD, is that it, from Hellboy? Secure, contain, protect. Oh, I see, right, no. Foundation deals with, ah, gotcha, okay, that's a, uh -huh, right. controversial, but I think the follow-up books are better than the original Jim. <laughs> Which ones though? Uh, all of them, you think, um, Neil? I, th I think they're, they're. I think almost each of them is slightly different. I, I'd, I'd say the last two are pairing, but I think all, June is is very much one thing. Um, I I think that I I actually really like June Messiah. I think it's a very very good political political thriller and a bit of action and so on. But it's but it's um it's it's very good. Children of June kind of brings it back to a kind of more of an adventure. Um, you know, um, uh, but God, God Emperor, then yeah, I, I think actually, uh, I would, I'm not sure if they're better, but I'd, I'd say they're as, at least as good as, but everyone's entitled to their opinion. I don't think it's a controversial one, Neil. I think, uh, I think God, uh, Jim Messiah is very, very tightly written, and, and I think if you, I, I'm not quite sure why it's that length, to be honest, because, um, Jim Messiah, God Emperor, um, because everything else is reasonably chunky. And I, I, we were talking about it. I sometimes think it really should should be a part of June. I think isn't it the way some doesn't, doesn't Tolkien often Tolkien often talk about that the Silmarillion really should have been 
part of the Lord of the Rings, and I suppose the Hobbit's the prologue to it, you know. So that they're, they're very tightly written, and I, I would comment better on the last two Bene Gesserit books if, I, if we knew where they were going to go. I think it's hard to comment on various things that are set up and laid down because we Frank Herbert sadly passed away, and that pickup is by different authors, so it's, it's hard to sort of see where they were going. But I do enjoy them. And as I said, I think we all talked about the whole the whole sex thing going a bit strange with the within those books, a bit more a bit more seemingly you think it's got more sixties sensibilities, but he's writing them in the eighties, isn't he? Look for the SCP wiki if you like dark supernatural stuff, I think you'll like it. I will do. Uh secure contain protect. Sounds interesting. Connor uh Jim is saying go never Neo says. Uh if you also know. Messiah and God Emperor are heavy on Frank Herbert, Herbert's political warnings and thinking. Yeah, and I think they have to be. Because within Junior, you, and he, he's not, you know, he's not going to ram this, doesn't ram it down your throat. He sets June, June is entirely the setup. And so the message and the warning and all that, it, and, and it, is, it, it, it really opens your eyes to government in a way, I think. A lot of people have a massive disconnection from, from government. And, um, Prequels left me cold. Goodness, I haven't I haven't gone near the prequels, um, or anything like that. As I said, it, it, it's it's whenever you enjoy a property, I think. To me, June was unfinished when I read it, and uh, I enjoyed it. And a lot of the speculation comes from wondering what if and what what could have happened. And there are so many different threads within June. I think we've we've talked about this. You can read June in a different way. If you think about it, we're looking at it at the minute in an evolutionary way. You know, and if you look at Butler and so on, if you read it, think about evolution all the way through the six books. You'll go, hmm. And then we're going to have a look at it from the, the point of a hero, the heroic mess of that. Let's look at that all the way through. It present, there's different things that you'll you'll pay attention to as you read, June, and you'll follow them. And then it's the same if you, if you actually try to concentrate on the ecological message rather than anything else. You can follow these threads all the way through, and you could. So I think you can read June, and I don't know if people do this. I do. Um, they could, they'll they'll read it from a different point of view. Uh, you know, within your own. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna read it again. I'm gonna enjoy it. I love it, but I'm gonna focus on this aspect, and I think it opens the books up enormously because I I had to read them about eight or nine times. You know, over three years. Um, no, oh, excuse me, we've got flies all over the place at the moment. Messiah is an essential link, the prequels then because that Leto's kind of tragic character. But yes, again he is. I think he's absolutely a tragic character. I'd also add that he's comic. I think he's yeah, he's 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 very funny. Um I find I find I think the God Amber is hilarious. Uh, um Is there a link between Golem memory access and BS other memory? Is that BG other memory? Soup pot, I think. Is that Barry Jesuit? I think you mean. Uh, hmm. Well, it's, it's yeah, yeah. That's what I thought. Yeah, thank you, Soup Pot. Um, yeah, I, I think regardless of the, the how the how the Barry Jesuit comes to access their other memory, the fact that it, 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 it's a genetic thing and it's in their cells. So I, I think the other, it's all about access, isn't it? Um, access to, to other memory. And for whatever for whatever genetic reason, they're unable to get, get to the meal line. But there's an attempt to, uh, yeah, but it's, uh, again, the, the, how the goal of technology works really in terms of what Frank was thinking. As somebody pointed out, that, you know, they're, they're, it's, it's cells of a, an individual taken from their corpse, taken from a cadaver. Um, and so the, the assumption is that there's something in the DNA um, that, the, the, that contains um, the, the other memory or race memory, different terms for this stuff, and that somehow that, that whenever we grow a human being from one of these cells, which I suppose we can't, that it's, um, that we can, well, we've got a copy, but then how do we get, how do we, as, as Supot saying, uh, how do we kickstart the original uh, memories from a cell? and um it's pain um yeah so it's it's one of those things that's not particularly scientific and it's a very interesting uh, as new says it's a very fascinating concept 
genetic memory. Um, and they're, they're, we, you know, we think about, okay, within, within the information that's passed on with genes, you know, I take a puppy and I throw it in, in the, a bath and it knows how to swim. I take, put your baby in the water and it swims. How does it know how to do that? Um, and uh, the, 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 there's a memory there is, is um, one way of looking at it. But rather than that, there's an instinct, I suppose, is uh, another. Um, but it's one of those things that we talk about and we have no evidence for it at all. So um, the, again, other memory concepts, things like um, perpetual race memory are, are generally things that have come out of um, uh, psychology and uh, other, other uh, you know, the psychoanalytical world and, and uh, I suppose other people, again, we're talking about different groups that use mythology. Uh, fascinating concept, Herbert explained, a pagan-like regard for ancestors. Uh, people against goodness and normalcy. Pagan's an interesting word if you go to its origins, I think. Um, genetic memory exists as instinct, for example. Yeah, so, so you know, we're, we're all... Uh, uh, oh, is that a homeopathy? Or oh, the homeopathy? Is that what you're? Is that what you're? Uh, is that a mis we, we missed? You've got, I thought you've got an umlaut on that, so I'm maybe assuming it's not a misprint. Or epigenetics. <clears throat> I think is that homeopathy? You mean uh, <laughs> epigen after genes? Um, homeopathy is um, the same pathology, same disease. Uh, sympathetic magic is the other term for it. Uh, but we don't, you don't hear that bandied about too much. Um, though that's maybe something else altogether, <laughs> right? Epigenetics. Um, it's written in German. Ah, that's why the umlaut. So, but oh, so the opposite. Oh, okay. So, sorry, sorry for my bad German accent. I'm a, uh, I'm a very good German friend. I, if he's ever watching any of these, say hello to him, Stefan. Hi, Um uh, And he's, he's got a particular accent. He's a very great turn with English English phrases. Uh, He's very fun. Um, homeopathy, yeah. Uh, do, 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 do. So homeopathy is, is quite interesting. If you look at um, uh, yes, while you dilute stuff with water, have you, there's a sketch Mitchell and Webb do where they go into a homeo, homeopathic uh, pub. Have you seen this? <laughs> and it's basically a barman pulling them a pint of water and then like a drop of. <laughs> <coughs> Ah, oh, dear, oh dear. You're, I think you're in Germany, aren't you, Ryan? I believe. I'm not too sure. <laughs> Where you dilute the stuff in the water, and that's it. So, um, I have a great story about Berlin, actually. Uh, involving me trying to go to the, the right museum, and the correct museum in Berlin, and ending up in the wrong museum in Berlin, and being much happier with the, the museum I was in than all I was going to. Um, has anyone got any other questions? Yeah, gen genetic memory is one of those things that's, um, you know, Mitchell and Webb are excellent. They are very funny. Uh, <laughs> I, I think they they've had a bit of a they do a, they do a, a post apocalyptic quiz show with some sort of mysterious plague remain indoors. And I think uh, it's kind kind of been almost considered a bit prophetic, but just before uh, COVID arrived, you know, if you haven't seen Mitchell and Webb, they're uh, you know, I think you'll probably get some of their stuff uh, on the BBC, BBC America or something like that if you're in the States. But they're very funny. Um, hmm. How are we doing? So, yeah, genetic memory is, a, is an interesting thing. And again, when Herbert Herbert's looking at a lot of the research of geneticists and uh, the turn of the century, guys. Um, you know, and, and I suppose to do with, you know, the work on, you know, genes and working on crops and things like that at a genetic level and um, so I've not got my head on quite right tonight but um, my words are failing me but um, yeah the whole, the whole thing about I, I think what's really interesting is that particularly within society uh, coming out of uh, I suppose the end of the 20th century you start to see this idea of you know concepts of um, you know genetics we talk about t-cells and the idea of controlled evolution and working with genes and the, 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 the response against it by politics that's pandering to religion um, is quite interesting. So the, the fact that the Benny Tags are sort of 
And again, we always have this, you know, the Bani Gesserit aren't religious at all, but pretend to be. And the Bani Tamaks totally are religious, uh, to the point where they, they look at DNA, etc., as the language of God. And they're, 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 that's their, I think, approach to things, is that their end goal is really... And I might be wrong about this, somebody can correct me, but I think Sufism is, is within Islam is a bit more similar to, I suppose, the idea of Zen, I think, than, than, than Sunni Islam. And I, I think the idea is, I think, if, you know, it's, a bit, it's the, the idea, the difference in studying a flame and grasping it to understand it, if, it, if that's a decent enough metaphor. I may be wrong there. Um, and that's the idea of human computers. Yeah, that's a real thing, Neil, by the way. We, how do we chat about it? Um, the, that's the inversion. Without machines to do the work of man, men are turned into specialized machines like the Mentats. Yeah. So if, if um, there's a quite a good book. Is it Bill Bryson's The History of Almost, is it The Complete History of Almost Everything, which kind of does take you through a very good run through famous science, scientific discoveries and so on. Um, but he, there's a section in it where he'll discuss the women that were, um, is it the women that worked with, for the Hubble project, initially for the, the work on the, that Hubble was doing or something, I think, they, but they were computers. Um, and I think, I think you'll find this mentioned in, I was trying to remember who, but I can't remember, but I think you'll find it in Regency type literature, you know, Jane Austen type stuff, that, you know, advice to, for picking up a good husband in society is make sure he's a good computer. Um, so com people have been computers. That's not a thing that um, it's a real thing. People have, um, as, and people have been calculators as well. Um, so the, the, that's a real thing. People have actually been those things in the past. Um, so the inversion, yes, that's the, 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 the this retardation of against thinking machines creates these um, mental physical skills, and indeed people need to become specialized like machines. Like, like the Mentats. So the Mentats are part of that response to, um, I, we don't want to have thinking machines, we're going to make people like machines. And that that's part, um, Brian saying it's the occult part of Islam. Hmm. Um, Richard Burton, who we were talking about uh, the other night, um, explored a lot of this, right, you know, and I think he became a, I think he became a Sufi master. Um, so a little bit about him, what I know of Sufism is really from him, but he, you know, he he's a person who immersed himself in the cultures of uh, just you know learned the language immediately and pretty much wanted to know everything about these people. Very respectful, interesting man. Um, Sufism, there we go. Puzzles the brain. <laughs> Very good. I don't see many of these two. Emojis, etc. I don't interact with people in the real world very much, and I don't interact with people particularly online for a lot. So, um, as I said, this has all been a bit new to me. Um, so it's quite interesting. But yeah, I wondered if it was a comment on autism, and that's being machine like precision organized thinking. Hmm. Not sure about that. The fundamental flaw with the data with the mental is insufficient data. Um, which is a fundamental flaw for any any human, I suppose, collating information on, on on putting together an argument. You'll never have you'll never have all the information. You'll never have all the data. And not that data means anything to humans. Um, Hello, Becky. You okay? Um, hmm. It's possible. I think that there's a few things that, that follow that kind of thinking. Um, about the, there's there's something about the um. You'll find it in the videos, I believe, uh, Neil. We'll get there. It'll hit the word autism. Oh, it's I tell you what it is. I remember now. It's to do with the autistic impulse. Um, if you if you dig back, I think into, I think it might be our second episode, which is the literary review episode two. I think you'll find that somebody did a bit of work on that. Um, it's ringing a bell. So it's it's a very good point, Neil Padfa. Um, Sufi is not that. Richard Burt's a fascinating man, great read. Absolutely. Um, he's a, he's a, yeah. So uh, he's got books out there that you would probably enjoy. You know, the, the Vikram and the Vampire is a good one. The, the Arabian Nights is obviously not him, but he's, he's the main accurate translator. Uh, he, he's considered pure filth in Victorian times, by the way. 
um, because he believed in accurately translating things. And the, 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 the Thousand Nights and One Night of the Arabian Nights is very saucy. Um, and, but there, there are so many sanitized versions of there's versions of it for kids. You know, there's a lot of these stories are quite popular. But he's associated with those two books in particular. But he has a Seven the Hidden Valley, I think, is a number of anthropological works. And he, he was a uh, yeah an ex, a superb man and uh, great great sketches a lot of you know a lot of adventures and uh, as an artist he, he really captured a lot of peoples and different tribes and aspects of Africa and really just you know knew how to behave himself amongst other cultures and be respectful uh, I think he's he's often disgusted about at the British and, and what they get up to um, and they're. That he's not liked at all by the British establishment, and he's considered extremely dangerous by the British establishment. Um, and and uh, he is ex yeah, the devil drives. He's one of the people um, I've been called this in my time. Some uh, not long ago, somebody called me the devil himself. But uh, there are a few people who get compared to the devil in society, and uh, like Lord Byron, um, Richard Burton was considered the living embodiment of the devil. I, he liked to enjoy that. He cultivated it. It was a personality thing. But that's correct, Neil. Um, so because of um, his association with Eastern literature, Kama Sutra being a, you know, a, a manual of sort of love and sex kind of thing, uh, healthy living kind of thing, um, he, he, you know, he, very important as a linguist. I think he spoke about 90 dialects and God knows how many languages. Um, his, you know, his academic chops are massive um, and his, his intent is good. I think so. He, he perpetuates an image, but he, he's a bit like he's a, he's a bit prickly when it comes to injustice and that kind of thing. And I think um, British society is full of nasty little bureaucrats trying to put one over on him. So I'm, I'm, I think there's a comment about at some point. I think something to do with his Arabic lecture or an examiner planned on just failing him and decided that he wouldn't wouldn't um, set the exam uh, basically because he was going to fail and Burton spoke better Arabic than just about anyone there and they, they all knew it and he basically didn't sit and put examine him on his Arabic for his qualification or something because uh, he was going to deliberately fail Burton and, and he understood that Burton would be extremely vindictive and probably smack him in the face challenge him to a duel and kill him um, oh Flashman is, I wouldn't say Flashman's based on him at all no um, he might look a bit like him, but uh, no, Flashman's based on the bully from um, Tom Tom Brown's school days. Is that correct? I think Flash. I, I've only read one Flashman book, Neo. I thought it was hilarious. Uh, um, it could partly be. I, I don't know. Flashman's nothing like Richard Burton at all. <laughs> uh, Fla I, I quite like Flashman. He's a kind of cowardly bully. He's, he, he somehow gets by. He's, he's a very real uh kind of human but I don't, i've only read the first one but I, I i don't think he's like burden at all um just based on that first book but it was well, they're good fun it was a good fun book i suppose if you you kind of enjoy that kind of stuff like the, the sharp books and um <coughs> excuse me you know hornblower and stuff like that um that kind of you know, napoleonic period and so on and so forth but yeah he, he is a kind of a so yeah flashman's interesting i think Hmm. Got me thinking about something there for a wee second. Uh, I'm trying to remember what it was. Backing up a wee bit. Richard Burton's found it very invaluable these days to be alone with your own thoughts. Says Sean, telecommunication and social media has created a lot of over-socialised people with no thoughts of their own. Yeah, a lot of us just tend to retweet, don't we? I suppose it's 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 good to have you, good to be your your own self. Um, they can, so they can only project, not conclude results. Projection. Hmm. Yeah, I suppose Merkin's what Mentat's working with incomplete. I mean, that's that's the yeah, Tiffer Howard gets it badly wrong, doesn't he, in June? And then he's because of that. And so so does Piter. The the Mentat's a flawed idea. It's it's any any kind of absolute. I think in the June universe is is a precarious um, thing. You know, the whole point of Doctor Huey's little diamond soak thing. You know. There's, oh no, this guy can't possibly. There's an absolute, you know, guaranteed this guy will not do it. You know, and there's no such thing as absolutes, I think. Um, 
It always seemed the adventures are similar. Is that what you mean, Neil? Well, well, yeah. But, well, I'm very much so. I think, I think, um, I miss adventures. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I, I wasn't sure if that's what you meant because the, one is a massive coward, and the other one is one of the most aggressive in your face, <laughs> confident people um, who, who who wouldn't fight an Aiken. You know, again, they're different. But yes, the adventures that kind of you know through Africa and stuff. Um, they, they, just the interesting thing with Burton is that they're real. And um, there's a, how he met Speak actually was that he Speak I think had been staked out and, and by some some uh, I'm not sure a North African tribe and they had literally speared him, um, stuck spread eagled him and were spearing him and I think Burton had taken a they were attacked and Burton had taken a spear right through the face and uh, horror issue horn below 100 he, he knew there was a British warship just just over the ridge and the coat and he ran to it for help. Uh, and while they tortured Speak, who's a big, Hanning Speak's a big game hunter. And, and he's the, he's a lot to do with, there's a controversy over him and, Horn, um, him and uh, Richard Burton. Um, and he, he basically arrived, got the spear out, I think got the spear out of his face, wrapped it up, grabbed a couple of guns and, and piled back again and slaughtered these guys da, 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 and saved Speak. Um, and that, that's, like, that's kind of a lot to do with how they... And they bonded, I suppose. So, but you know, and the, the massive scar right through his face is uh, uh, Burton had big, big drooping black mustaches and, and a, a, I think black eyes and very penetrating stare. His his wife is what you would consider Catholic, pretty much nobility um, at the time. But he, he has a political career after his adventures, and so I think he ends up as a consul to Brazil, possibly in the area. But his wife, sorry, somebody mentioned it earlier, and I, I did want to backtrack. Neil Papa says his wife burnt a lot of his papers, sadly, and it, it's, it's to do with what we're talking about, um, that she, she really wanted to try and control his legacy and felt that a lot of his um, a lot of his work is, is what she considered pornographic beyond belief, and that the Victorian society, which is quite filthy, by the way, would have thought that this was quite pornographic, and to be honest with you, none of us would bat too much of an eyelid at any of it today it's it might be a bit sexy but that that's about it it's and it's it's writing it's um so his reputation really based on the attempt to get as, as honest um uh, actual translation to to get the real flavor of the arabian nights and uh, there's another translator i believe who was working on a on a, a tame palatable version but my understanding is that um he very much he, they actually helped each other so if you ever get a, a copy of, I've, I've got a very good one that I'm reading at the minute, but it's not a Burton one. I've, I've got an abridged copy of Burton's, but it's quite hard to get. I think it's quite, quite expensive. But I would, if you ever want the ultimate version of the Thousand and One Nights, sorry, the Thousand Nights and One Night in, in English is the Richard Burton translation. So because a lot of the material was saucy, his wife just, she, so we, we lot, she burnt a whole lot of his stuff. Uh, an absolute travesty. And it was to protect his reputation, and I, it was it was stupid because his reputation was well known already, you know? <laughs> and it's very sad. So we have we have a body of his anthropological works and some of his stories and things like Vikram and the Vampire, and um, but he, he's a he's a major part of of he's a big part of history, I think. Um, uh, but he's an incredible man, and. Uh, yeah, there should be more people like Richard, but because I think he was, whatever you think of him, um, you know, people living, not everybody who lives in, in, in the British Empire at the time is British as an imperialist. And um, he, he enjoyed, as he put it, being in the gutter with real people and, and preferred being there himself. He, there's, a, there's, a, there's something of Richard Burton about, I don't know if you know the end of Gulliver Jones, or sorry, not Gulliver Jones. Gulliver's travels, but basically Gulliver moves into the stables with the horses, <laughs> and it's it's about decent companionship and honesty in life. And uh, the British really are quite, you know, they're they're not very nice to him. The establishment anyway, and he he um, he he's simply far too dangerous, I think, for them to handle. Um, you know, they they can slag him off all they want and try and manipulate his life and his career. But um, if you did that to Richard Burton, you risked getting a slap on a duel. And he, he's he's um I think he's considered the finest fencer in the world, um, bar none. And uh, his reputation at the time is is um, you know he's the devil. You don't mess with that guy. And the ladies faint when he walks by. 
um, and he's just this, Jesus, you know, what the hell is that thing? He's an enormous, massive presence, if you know what I mean. There we go, folks, a wee bit about Richard Burton, but um, I'm a big fan of his, I think he's a very interesting person. And uh, there we go. Anyone got any more questions for me? I'm going, my coffee's gone cold, I'm going to swap over to some juice. But this is good fun, I hope you're all enjoying it. I think we will wrap up things a wee bit soon, Sunday night, but um, I'll tell you what, guys. Sean sent Horatio Hornbrewer 100%. Yeah, Horatio Hornbrewer is fantastic. Um, there's a TV series uh, starring Ewan Griffith. Griffith, and uh, it's, it's a good companion to Sharp, by the way. I was involved, I don't know if anybody knew this, that there was a big mystery, a big competition, or one of these things on the internet for a long time about a mystery as to who Sharp's father was. Um, and that, that did not end well, but if you go to uh, the author of Sharp's website, and you'll find me involved in that. <laughs> because I was trying to demonstrate to my son that there's no such thing as an unsolvable problem. Burton was a rasputin like counter bloody and destructible. <laughs> yes. Oh, dear. I love that song by Boney. I'm ra ra rasputin, lover of the Russian queen. It was it? They shot him, stabbed him, cut off his neck, threw him in a river, but he still did. <laughs> That's not the lyric. But I, I like to I like to fill in with all the things that they did to him before. It's a very good song. I love that. So yeah, Burton Burton's incredible. Um, I, I said uh, Philip Jose Farmer's River World led me to you know how books lead you to people. Uh, that's the book that led me to Richard Francis Burton. He's the, he's the protagonist of those stories. Um, and we were talking about a steampunk. Um, Book, was it the affair of Spring Heated Jack? So he, he um, himself as a historical person, he's become a he's become a, a much he's become a real character and in, in particularly science fiction. Right. Paddy O'Brien's books about the Royal Navy are recommended as well. You know, Papa, but I don't read too many naval books, I suppose. Um, but I, I, I do like uh, the particular Paul Sean for submarine genre, and there, there's a set of. Uh, you know, quite interesting science fiction submarine books, and Frank Frank Herbert's Dragon in the Sea would be one of them. I'm just trying to think, uh, there's uh, you know, and that includes Twenty Thousand Leagues Under the Sea, you know, and Neville Neville shoots on the beach, I think, which is a there's a film of. There we go. Do 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 do. Who we got? I think we've got a few of you left here still. So has any has anybody got any questions or any comments about? Ah, uh, Patrick O'Brien writes the Master and Commander books that's who you're talking about again i think i've read one and i saw the film and uh, uh i quite enjoy that kind of period i suppose and i'm not really interested in history of modern history but um oh, well, the peninsula wars and uh the napoleonic wars are slightly interesting i suppose <coughs> excuse me Eu european history is pretty much most of the same stuff over and over again it gets a bit old um yeah jules verne Excellent. I said that the first, first, there's a lot of Dune in, in the Dragon in the Sea or Under Pressure 21st Century stuff. There's a lot of stuff that he's, he's kind of set up and played with and then he's, he's taken it and transplanted it into Dune. Film of Master and Commander is so good. It is, yeah, it's, it's very realistic. It's very, um, that's what I liked about it, I think. And uh, you, can, you kind of do have, I suppose you have that relationship, isn't it? It really focuses on the, on the captain and his doctor. And a lot of these ships had companions, you know, the captains would have companions on board. And so well, that's exactly what Darwin was doing on, on board the Beagle. Um, so, yeah. But um, as I said, folks, we're all things science fiction here. And I, I know a lot of us are talking about June. We get we get to that or a wee bit about other science fiction stuff. So I'm not too uh, familiar with things like what your favorite films or, uh, you know, TV shows are and stuff like that. Um, Herbert was building up to Jim for years. I feel yes. I think I think you can you can clearly see that from from the point where he goes to whenever we get to ecological section, uh, Neil. Um, the point where he really goes to start researching that that article all the way up. He's put he puts many years at least at least five years. Min that's the minimum amount of time I can see he's put into that writing. So just all research. Whatever it is he's doing, there's five years of work before it's published in '63. Um, you know, so June's genesis is definitely in the '50s. Um, TV sucks completely, in my honest opinion. 
it's it's gotten a bit crap, hasn't it? It's, there's so much. I miss I miss having a couple of channels, and uh, I'm a person that can't handle too much choice. My my brain doesn't like it. If I walk into a restaurant, I want to see three things on a menu, and three things is two things too many. <laughs> um, as far as I'm concerned, I'm very bad at choosing. And I um, how we use Netflix and stuff, things like this. This is not how I can look at a lot of information as a human being. It's not suitable. Um, I'd much I miss my video, my DVD store. We don't have anything like this anymore, and. Um, it's hard to find stuff as well. I find a lot of these these things just get off for you the same nonsense over and over. TV. So there are some wee gems within television, I think. Um, and I, I quite like a lot of old television. Uh, I was actually saying before, I don't know why we don't. There's a lot of old sci-fi on the telly, off the telly, and old black and white stuff. And we don't see it. I think you get some of it on Amazon. They, they really do charge you for it, don't they? Uh, which is really sad. Because you know, I know they don't want to milk, milk it, but it's things like the old Buck Rogers and Flash Gordons and things like that. Um, where are you at, Ryan? By the way, are you in Germany? Uh, I think we had a conversation, I might be wrong, but um, not much TV in a decade. I'm glad of it, yeah. The T it's become TV download, really, hasn't it? You download what you want to watch. Um, but TV used to be very good here, but uh, again, a lot of television in Northern Ireland. 70s and 80s about 90 percent of our programming would have come from the us <clears throat> excuse me uh not much the channel 4 version of utopia seemed almost prophetic in hindsight you're right so it's it's uh so i used to get some great television and uh television was one of my educators and uh because i have a which was quite annoying for me whenever the tv cut off because I can't sleep, so we, even as a little kid, I'd be under the covers with a TV and a book and a torch. And uh, uh, they used to shut the three channels off. I've got Channel Four eventually in the UK in the early eighties, I think. Um, but uh, yeah, I would switch to radio and try to pick up, you know, uh, radio channels from Europe. Um, but I, some some great TV, and I think a lot of the old shows that, that have the wonky sets and stuff. I think old old Doctor Who is a hundred times better than new Doctor Who, and. Um, Things like the Twilight Zone and the, the Outer Limits that they, they like to remake. That kind of television I miss. And um, there's something something um, really nice about sitting around on a, on a dark night with your family watching, you know, having a bit of food on the sofa and watching something in black and white. Um, there's an atmosphere about it that's... So even think TV shows like The Monsters and uh, The Addams Family, I love them. Uh, Channel Four version of Utopia. That was that was pretty. That was excellent. I really enjoyed that. And, it, and they just cut it short. I think it just it, did, it died. It didn't get finished. Um, so there we go. But um, I, I, I was talking about some TV shows the other day. And I thought, well, so, there was somebody doing stuff on Twitter, and I, I occasionally like to offer suggestions to a couple of people. And you try to reach out to a few people in the June community, I suppose. But somebody was looking for like weird TV and movies and and. Uh, or, the, the TV show that I recommended to them was, um, well, I recommended to them a boy and his dog for films and, and Stalker. Just thinking about weird, but TV show I recommended was Sapphire and Steel. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever seen this. With um, it's a British show with uh, David McCallum and Joanna Lumley, and it's from the, it's either from the very late seventies or the very early eighties. I can't remember. Uh, and it's a science fiction show. Uh, it's fantastic. And it freak you out if you're. Uh, I can remember being a little kid and watching it and being absolutely scared out of my wits. But, but you know, God, I know it. And, um, oh, thanks, Sean. Uh, I'm see, I'm trying to figure out what sort of new content to do. As I said, I'm not, not involved in academia and don't have the resources anymore. So, as much as I'm, I'm building up a wee science fiction station here, I'm trying to. Trying to bring it down from the academic. I think a lot of people stay away from this, I think, because they think it's too highbrow. And I'm, I'm, I'm trying to find a balance, I think. Um, but I'm enjoying doing, running the station, and I, I, I love science fiction. And I, I thank you very much. In terms of the going back a bit, I'm done. Yeah, I'm, I'm 40, 48, I think. I, don't know. <laughs> I think I'm 48. I'm not too sure. Um, back in the day, we got English crummies. <laughs> I ah, Sean, the, the the boy and his dog thing. That's that that book had just come out, and uh, I just thought it was really timely. Um, 
I'm glad, glad you. Yeah. yeah, just because they get such a bad, such a bad press, um, and because of the film. Um, so the film's great, by the way. I love the film, <laughs> and I love the books. Um, is an, um if anybody hasn't, uh, give me a second. Uh, you see, we moved the house a bit, move things around a bit. There it is. Ah, oh, get out of there. Oh, my oh, goodness. Wrecking the place. There we go. But that's that's the, the floods the rover. And I don't buy new science fiction very often. Uh, do, do, do. And that's fantastic. Uh, and I really just wanted to let people know about it because it's got the scripts and a, a lot of insight. And I've wanted to know uh, what happened, and I loved it. But it, it, it's it's a final completion to these stories, and uh, tear through it tonight. I, I loved it, absolutely brilliant. Um, so it was just kind of one of those things that um, uh, <laughs> uh, that and, yeah, put right. And I, I was like, actually, might do. Me, I was thinking about doing me thing on uh, Buckaroo Banzai and the Adventures in the Eighth Dimension because it's. I understand finally getting a, a literary sequel next month for any of you here into um, uh, into Buckaroo Banzai. Back in the day, we got English. What's that, Ryan? English crimmies. Crimmies, crimmies. What? I'm, def, I'm not sure of that word. Call, uh, keep up the high brow. Is it called Edgar Wallace? Edgar Wallace. That name rings a bell. Can you flesh that out a wee bit for me, Ryan? Uh, oh, crime stories, right? Yeah, love the Buckaroo Banzai too. That's great to hear. Yeah, I just noticed that the the, the book is um, scheduled for release on sometime next month. I think I don't think, I think I'd even written a, a date. I think it might be the sixteenth of next month, something like that. Buckaroo Banzai, twenty first of the could be. So if I have to type it in, it's the original author and so on. So it's uh, and um, it's one of those things where old properties are. You know, we were always promised a sequel to the Buckaroo Brands Island. It's the one that's promised at the end of the screen. So uh, Edgar Wallace crime stories. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think that rings a bell. Um, used to get things like Penny Penny Novels, Penny Dreadfuls, yeah. Um, we've, got, we've got Ray Bradbury's Mystery Theatre over here. We had a, we had think shows like Arthur C. Clarke's Mysterious World, which I've, there's a companion book to it, which I have. Somewhere him going all around the world and investigating kind of various scientific mysteries and stuff. It's pretty good. Um, but for those of you who haven't seen Sapphire and Steel, it it comes across a little bit as a supernatural thriller. Um, I think it's four or five of them. And oh, what happens to Sapphire and Steel in the end? Oh, uh, uh, the, um, the, car the actors are phenomenal. And it's a bit like uh, the old daytime theater that you get but uh, the genius is how they, it's acted and how it's lit and uh, they represent basically sort of uh, the, you don't know what the enemy is always in sapphire and steel it's just this thing but it's time um uh and it's uh as i was there you go so it's it's if, if I, might, I might do something on it but it's it's kind of i don't think anybody's ever i'm, I'm pleased somebody there has heard of it <laughs> Keep it up, says Neil Panther. The highbrow is what's needed in sci-fi. Um, I suppose I'm, I, I'm not that. I, hopefully I'm not too highbrow, uh, Neil, I suppose, because I, I'd like to... I, my, my goal here is to make things accessible, I think, and, and, and to have a bit of fun with it. This is kind of what I wanted to do with my career a few years ago uh, that never really happened. So I, I'm enjoying this enormously. And there's so much in science fiction. Neil Panther said Asimov's Foundation is a TV series now. Um, I'm a bit young, big in the sixties. Uh, so, I there's a few. See again, we, I, I, a lot of the shows that I watched as a as a young person growing up, they're they're not they're not the current shows from America. <laughs> you understand? You guys were getting, uh, uh, they were old TV shows, um, and hence hence an awful lot of black and white TV. And it's about BBC, you know, BBC One, BBC Two, two sides of the BBC, which very much establishment at the time, and, uh, uh, and ITV, really. So that once Channel Four came along, Channel Four was uh, pretty good, actually. There was a delight to see it. Um, and then the only, the only sort of thing you could stay up watching all night would be The Open University, which is which is what I did. It would be on BBC Two. But they're all educational programs. <laughs> but uh, there we go. So... Um, 
Prime Minister's, yeah, some uh, foundation. I, I'm not able to see it. I don't have. I'm. I suppose we've got Netflix and Amazon in this house, and that's it. And we're not. Uh, pardon me. I love Blake Seven Neil Pad. Um, I was particularly distraught one Christmas, as I'm sure you may know. Um, if anybody doesn't know Blake Seven, it's kind of a combination of uh, 1984 and We and Brave New. Those kind of things. Those kind of dystopian nightmares in space meets kind of a. The Magnificent Seven meets kind of Robin Hood. Um, not spoiling it for anybody, I suppose, but it's the show, it's called The Show That Ruined Christmas here. <laughs> uh, it's a great series, Neil. And do you know why? Can you remember why, Neil, it ruined Christmas? <laughs> uh, when I was around five, we got two English TV channels. One was Sky and the other, I don't remember. Ah. Sky, that's, whoa, there we go. Yeah, basically the, the the fact that the episode came out at uh, Christmas, the last episode of Blake Seven, they all get killed at the end. All of them just get slaughtered. Happy Christmas! <laughs> it's 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 quite notorious um, for, for for people of my generation. It's it's the, the last episode of Blake Seven is this the show that ruins a lot of people's Christmases because it was quite oh no oh my oh my god they're all dead. And it kind of fitted with Thatcher's. It's very dark. Show. It fitted with Thatcher's Britain. So you're literally getting ready to give you, oh, Blake Seven's on Christmas, and, you're on the, and then they all die. And then I think you get Val Dunigan doing Christmas songs straight after. So it was, it was, it was quite shocking. And uh, it was, oh, come on, somebody's going to stay. No, every single one of them. And it ends with the one guy that you think might, might rule the universe with the evil bad, uh, the evil villainess. And yeah, he hears all the gunshots going off, and that, that's it. You know. Uh, <laughs> I think there's ones in the UK soldiers. Ah, see, a couple of channels. Uh, uh, yeah, Federation always wins. Yeah, the Federation. I think the whole, the whole, the whole set. I think you know you'll look back at this and go, "God, this looks crap," and it, it it'll have the same feel as the old Doctor Who's. It's kind of filmed the same way, the same. Uh, you know, the, the BBC look. And, you know, filmed in quarries and rubber monsters and blue blue sausages and stuff and uh, they, are, they used to have it on blue peter i think you know the, the kids tv for how to make their little guns and their, t their teleporters and stuff like that um i i did read the tripod books uh sean as a teenager and i read them when the tv series came out if you remember on uh, i think it was a bbc series uh bfbs is still one of the best Radio stations. Oh, see, I don't know what that one is again. The 80s was dystopian. I've, I've become very disconnected from society, I suppose, in, in some ways. But uh, radio is a thing that I used to love. And um, I mean, really love. I used to love the radio. And uh, um, I don't know, you drift away from it. It's, the, it's a bit like watching your old videos and DVDs. You do miss these things. Um, but the, yeah, I've, I've, I think I was saying. Babs was talking about it. Was that a science fiction or rock and roll station or something like that? Um, I must have a look into internet radio and, and, and find myself some things that I can enjoy uh, enjoy looking at. British Forces Broadcasting Service. <laughs> All right. Did you just have a... Yeah, yeah, still one of the best radio stations. It is, it is very dystopian, I think. Um, yeah, we get a fair about it. I, I, mean, I mean, goodness, we'd have to talk about... I mean, we've gone into the 20s now. And the amount of post-apocalyptic um, science fiction that's being churned out is massive. Um, uh, and things like you know post-apocalypse nuclear war films, even your zombie films, you know, they were rare. And you you like zombie films because there was only a handful of them. And you you liked uh, you know it's the same as science fiction films. Science fiction wasn't that popular a uh, thing. You would you know it was popular more in the low budget sort of you know straight to video things. But your big films that come out on, on your, your science fiction film in the cinema, it was an event. You, you know, you really want, oh, here's a big sci fi film. Um, yeah, it's a wonderful inversion of Star Trek's Federation. Firefly took a lot from that. Uh, yeah, the, the Liberator is a, a great ship, I think, as well. I used to have a little toy Liberator, let's be green orb at the back. Uh, see, yeah, Radio 4 would have been that kind of area for those kind of shows. And I'll be honest with you that you can probably see one of them here. Let me just get it for you. Uh, this is the age of radio. From This is from the age of radio that I like. 
and I don't know if any of you have ever heard, this is the, the Brian the Sibley BBC Lord of the Rings, um, 13 episodes uh, adaptation. Uh, he, he, you know, um, Peter Jackson brought him in to work in on the uh, on the actual films. Uh, it's exquisite. I don't know if you can see that. It's, it's a metallic thing. And the cast of actors, I mean, you, you know, you'll there's a relationship, by the way, from the act, some of the actors in this to the ones in the film. Because um, Frodo's played by Ian Holm in the, in, the, in, the, in the original. And these are cassettes, by the way. Um, you know, and this, this, there you go. You see what I mean? And I, I'm, I, I do have, I, it's actually nice to listen on, on, on cassette, you know? Uh, but, oh, I'm not too sure about the, I think they're late seventies, but the cat, you know, the tip top actors, the product production on them is brilliant. And um, I, I don't know if the digital era has taken, there's a sound and a feeling to, to listen to. It's, it's something akin to what people say about listening to your old LPs. I don't know if that makes sense, you know. Soup Pot says, June. <laughs> uh, let's go and see. Sorry, what have we got here? I must catch up. Um, the Cold War is a dominant cultural backdrop. Yes, I, I'm actually, my, my father has a job. I'm, I'm called, the, the, the Cold War exists here at that time, um, to be honest with you. That's uh, not going to see... June in eighty four. <laughs> Going to see June in eighty four. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you, by the way, Ryan. I don't know if any of you have ever, if you're Lord of the Rings fans, but that set of, that those thirteen hours of audio tape are exceptionally good. And uh, my my favorite bit in it is uh, I'm trying to remember the character's name, but she's, it's the uh, it's the it's the woman from the House of Healing. In the Lord of the Rings, and uh, uh, Aragorn is played by Robert Steens. Robert, Robert Steens, um, the old Hammer horror actor. Uh, well, he's, I think he's a Shakespearean actor. And he goes, now, good dame, let us see if your feet can run as quick as your tongue and fetch me Athalas if a spring remains in this city. It's got, <laughs> it's got this uh, uh, wonderful sense about it, you know. And then she says, June's honest opinion says Neo Padfa. Uh, 1984 is when Threads was first broadcast too. Threads, I'm not sure what that one is. Sean. Uh, Lens is June, Honest Opinions. Neo, I love it. I think it's great. I mean, I'm a flawed film, but um, what's the point of a movie but to entertain, I think? And uh, it led me to the books eventually. But um, I uh, don't know what you guys think. Let, we'll get a wee sound off if you can all tell us what you think of the. Uh, honest opinions about David Lynch's film. I think there's wee flaws with the special effects and stuff. It's production, really, but um, I love it. I think it's it's uh, it's it's got the right sensibilities. I think. Um, I'm trying to think of old, old, old. There was an old puppet show. I think called Star Trek that used to be on on when I was young. Um, so I would have been eleven in 1984. Uh, I think the late seventies and early eighties are. Uh, Threads was about nuclear strike on Britain. Ah, yeah, we, we did have a lot of scary stuff uh, uh, like that at the time. I, I managed to get. <laughs> I I've been able to get my hands on all sorts of documents over the years. So at, at the time, I could tell you that I have. A, I had military NBC manuals and was reading them. <laughs> uh, I, I read a lot of strange things as a child. Um, so it's about nuclear war struggle, but cultural influence is undeniable. Well, the, the, back to the 1984. Um, sorry, to June. So, yeah, is that something? I think there was a bunch of programs about like that. There was, I think, the day after tomorrow, and uh, I think a lot of that stuff was designed to scare the crap out of us. Um, I don't think there's anything unscary about nuclear weapons, so. What was that? There was one I remember, guys. I don't know if you know this one. Can you remember Whoops Apocalypse? Uh, I think there was a film of Whoops Apocalypse, but I think there was a TV series as well. Um, I'm pretty sure there was. I think I remember watching that. Um, cultural influence is undeniable. So, the, yeah, I suppose we go. It's a funny time. Um, Sean, can I ask you a question? Was it Sean? Somebody was recommending me the, to read Starship Star Troopers the other day. Was that you, Sean? I can't remember. Or was it somebody here? Um, let's see. So Neopath is very much Lynn's version, but enjoyable. 
two pots of loop. <laughs> Yikes, make a quick wipe. Threads was actually banned by UK government for years for fear of panic by the public. Uh, it was made, I think, in 1981, but not released until 1984. Oh, you'll think that was usual, and that's okay. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, no, it was just something to do with the language um, that, that reminded me about that, but I'll, I'll think so. Whoever it was will we'll bring it up again, and I think I talked about it on yesterday's episode anyway. Um, hmm. You know, but yeah, June arriving at the time, 1984, I think, didn't it? The film came out in 1984, and we're all kind of talking about Big Brother and so on and so forth. Uh, you're, near, you're near enough then, it was like instant. <laughs> Science fiction looks at a lot of range of weapons. Uh, love the movie, Cross Wires there. Ah, regarding you. Huh. I mean, the, the, the nuclear bomb, then really we, we move up to you know, neutron weapons, antimatter weapons, and then there's all sorts of choice that we can make, such as pure vacuum bubbles. So, um, uh, yeah, I think. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah, we, we, nuclear weapons are useful, I think, but not, not for what we, not, for, not as weapons. I think nuclear tools would be better. I think we need to get rid of it. Almost all of them, get them or get them up somewhere where they can't do any harm. John Hurt as Winston Smith in 1984 is a superb performance. Yeah, yeah, it's it's really good. I'm trying to remember who plays him. Um, is it Gregor Fisher? Isn't that the comedian? Uh, and I'm trying to remember who played uh, Richard Burton. Yeah, uh, Richard Burton. Uh, Richard Burton, the actor. That's correct. So this is his last film. Ah. Yeah, well, that's, that's, uh, uh, yeah, everybody's good in that. Uh, I was just about to say that too. John Hurt was excellent. Um, really good, 1984. Um, 1984, I think, that if you want QI in, in this country, it's probably you'll watch QI with Stephen Fry. Or so it's Sandy Talks Week these days. And they, they, they asked the audience to put up their hands to see who had read 1984. And then a whole bunch of them put, put their hands up. And then they uh, then they told the audience that most people lie about reading 1984 and to put keep your hand up if you've really read. <laughs> and all these hands, I think about seventy five percent of the audience put their hands. Like Gregor Fisher, yes. Oh, the list they killed us there. I watch Brazil. Mm. Dude, 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 Gregor Fisher is excellent. Uh, the, the the Hamlet. If you, if you if you don't know who Gregor Fisher is, type in. Uh, uh, he's rap scene as, but it's a famous character. But type in the Hamlet cigar advert with the guy with the bald guy who's trying to get his passport photos and just watch him. He's a comedic genius, he's so funny. <laughs> I'll go for a few more minutes, folks. It's nearly midnight. I'll say we'll, we'll call it a day about in about eight minutes' time. Terry, uh, Brazil by Terry Gilliam is superb, yeah, absolutely. I think I suppose this thing we're all here talking about June and stuff, and, and we have so many, um. I'm saying that was bloody funny. As as I crack, absolutely right. Um, I don't know how how an American audience would take Ram scene as, but I don't know if they'd understand a word of it. Or just still, we will probably be more like Brave New World in 1984. Though, hmm. are you familiar with We, Sean? Um, We's quite interesting. I th I actually was having a look the other day. I think I spotted a film version of We. And um, I also think the other day I spotted a film version of Olaf Stables. It, it might have been, is it Last and First Men or, or Star Maker or something? I think I, so I've, I've noticed a couple of um, odd science fi science fiction films that are, uh, that have kind of either, uh, they're either new or they've, missed, uh, they've been off my radar altogether. Uh, but kind of, uh, uh, yeah, so <clears throat> goodness, I, um, I haven't read, have I got we here? I haven't read Wii since night. I read it nineteen ninety eight. I think. Let me just have a note. Is it there? Yeah, it is. Hang on. And um, a lot of people, this book sort of lost in the shadow of Orwell and, and uh, uh, Huxley. Uh, there you go. Yeah, Gemini Zamyatins. It has. Um, I'm not sure if you run with its uh, publication date because I think this book had to be smuggled. Initially, or or else that it's uh, its initial 
publication is, is different than I suppose in Britain than it would have been in, in Russia. Uh, but yes, it says here in the first introduction here, we a Russian novel that first saw the light of day in English in New York. Um, so uh, very much, I mean, you could almost, I would almost consider it, it's a bit like if you were studying classical history, you go Herodotus, the side of the Xenophon. And if you were, um, uh, if you were going to look at dystopian fiction in the 20th century, you'd go We Brave New World 1984. Um, uh how's it called so this book's just we that's what it's called uh it's yevgeny zam yatins uh if I'm, I'm going to do a video on it at some point I, I, i'd actually do a video it's something worth looking at is this book um brave new world and uh, 1984 1984 is an absolute nightmare and um uh the, what is it you know if you want to see your future is it, imagine if is it a, a, a hob but smashing into your face over and over and over again isn't it something like that uh once then sorry i just still people probably want to be in the subtitles but haven't read it yet how is it called we is it part we oh sorry no it's just we the word capital w small e that that's it um how about uh, look it up um yevgeny zam yatin so it's z-a-m-y-a-t-i uh you can have a look at him on um on wikipedia you know the, the, there's a good bit of information on these guys a jackpot neil thank you um so the, there's there's um, there's a sense if you read 1984 that the whole thing is meta itself um the, the book that you're reading is actually a product of that regime and that you could that there, there is a it is meta and it, um there you go that's it uh it's a very interesting book and as i said i i, I think and i th might be wrong but i just noticed this the other day and got a quick oh is that what i think it is and i think there's a russian film by by um Zamyan. I can tell you, folks, I'll tell you what, just before we go tonight, I can tell you the outstanding movie. Uh, makes you think of Stanley Swaff Lem. Yeah. Um, the outstanding movie that I've seen in recent years, science fiction wise, is um, Hard to Be a God. Um, and if, if you look at my A to Z of science, of the shape of things to come, it's, it's an A to Z of things that I'm going to do videos on, basically. Uh, you speak is a real thing. Double plus good. <laughs> All is double plus good. Um, I, I actually I'll tell you something. If you if you want to know how 1984 is real, we've had this going on for a while, and even some shops used to do it with their sales. Uh, buy two get one. Do these kind of things. But look at the price of chocolate. Look at what's happened to chocolate, and look what's happened to chocolate in the real world. And what happens to chocolate in 1984 is a very particular thing. True or false, Orwell's 1984 has been moved to the political section of books, so most likely. Um, I, I, I've stated this, I've, I've had arguments with people with this, and they've, they've been quite vehement at me. Um, it's my own theory, Sean, by the way. I don't know if other people came up with the, the meta thing. I, it was based on when the last time I read it. Um, Neil Padfoot, it's, it's the one book that most people have a pop at me for, for, for calling it science fiction. Um, how it's not science fiction is beyond me, and it, it's indicative that most people who argue about that haven't read it. <laughs> um, but no, it's, it should definitely sit in the science fiction section. Um, it's interesting, uh, science fiction books like Dune, it's a story, it's a piece of entertainment, it's also a warning. Um, to a degree, based on some of Donald Trump's behaviour, you'd wonder if uh, not him, but the fact that people around him had read Dune. He's, he was certainly um, the chosen one. He's trying to uh, operate on, on a, as a, at a messiah type level. <clears throat> um, but it, certainly in this country, uh, the, the, the price of chocolate in 1984, what they do is they go one week, the price of chocolate's 50p. So the next week they go, uh, the price of chocolate is now 60p, but it's been reduced from 70p. And the lie is that you knew it was 50p. So they always tell you the price goes down, but in fact it goes up. And, and the, the, if you look at this, the price is a chocolate, the size of chocolate bars. So there's, and I'm not a big chocolate nut, but that's one aspect of Orwell's 1984 that's here. Um, Sean, just to catch what you said, you said the meta theory is interesting. Orwell's inspired, but also disagree with James Burnham about that. And mangrelism generally. I do know this, Sean. There is a there is a piece by Orwell online about yeah, Sam Yatton. And it's it's about it, um, and I can't. Uh, I've only glanced at this. Uh, go have a look. 
but it's actually Orwell saying that um, really promoting the hell out of we. He's going, wow, look at this. But he he suggests that Brave New World rips the heck out of we, whereas he does not. Uh, and that was the gist of it. But it's somewhere online there, possibly on, on YouTube, or it might, might have been an essay by Orwell about we. Um, let's see, real look, Australia. Well, again, what, what will the government do in exceptional times? And, and you know, we, we all, if you look at, uh, well, look at, look at Texas with their attitude to women and, and birth at the minute, uh, women are second class citizens in this country. And all it takes is some idiot to be elected who can write a law. So a law is anything that's written down, really, that people agree to abide by. Um, or will never give up on his democratic socialism despite his experiences in the Spanish Civil War. Yeah, it's, uh, and it's to do with his, uh, and being there is to do with his wife, I believe, Sean. My understanding is that Orwell took a bullet in the throat in um, the Spanish Civil War. I might be wrong, long, long time since I looked at him. But that injury ultimately called many, many years later was something to do with his death. So 1984 was written in 1948, published, I think, and he died in 49. Um, but his, his wife was an Irish, uh, I think, revolutionary. Uh, Kennedy, there we go, yeah. Michael Anton has written about that as well. Anton calls it Caesarian. Caesar, Caesarism. Kaiserism, I'll go with, sorry. Well, as I said, you can, you can look at 1984 can be read as both a warning and a manual, uh, if you like. Is that is that what you mean by that? Um, let me get my second spidey experience. He, he caught, my God has written about that as well. Anton calls it Kaiserian. Sorry, Kaiser, Kaiserism. I'll, I always pronounce it. I know everybody says Caesar, but it is Kaiser. Um, I always pronounce it as a K. God and Bird Trump memes were beautiful. <laughs> yes, they were. Um, but it, it, I thought that was kind of scary. And, and Not that Trump... Trump's, June's not warning you about people like Trump. You, you shouldn't need to be warned about people like Trump. They're, they're, um, they're, they're, they are, they're, you should not need to be warned about people like that. It should be obvious what they are. Um, it's obvious as hell to me. There's something very interesting, as a particularly commentary out of America, is that you get people who will talk about Trump's intelligence. I can tell you that the man is not intelligent. And um, if you put me in a room with him, I'd humiliate him in seconds. Um, but the, the actual fact that some people think he is, I'd, I'd say their intelligence is pretty wanting as well. Um, Herbert was observing the cult of personality around JFK and it inspired Herbert. Yeah, have, have a look at the crowds, and I've got some photos of, her, of JFK in the, in the videos. Um, but they're particularly him visiting Ireland. I actually wanted to fish this guy out of his own pond here. I thought they were, they were, it was a good example to use. Um, Neil, uh, of 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 that cult of personality outside of his comfort zone, if you see what I mean, they they were they were worshiping him. Uh, it's quite appalling. <coughs> Kaiser, yeah, get the word czar as well from that. Kaiserism, yeah, Kaiser is the right and true pronunciation. Do 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 do. We sometimes we get the odd Latin and, and Greek words, but there's a few I think that are quite funny. But generally within Greek, for example, if you see a letter C, you pronounce it as a K. And uh, it's kind of funny that uh, going back to school, I had a really good English teacher for Mr. Stewart. He was called um, for for poetry, and um, I remember him be doing a, a Charles Manley Hopkins poem, and it's I would call it the loss of the Eurydice, but he used to call it the loss of the Eurydice, and um, didn't pronounce those those K's, uh, those C's, you know, and it is Eurydice, uh, for example. Um, so I was talking about actually trying to read the difference. Uh, I was looking at an article about Frank Herbert uh, to do with mythology and the White Plague and June and uh, the, the, the difficulty of how the White Plague is an ignored book and the difficulty of reading names that are in Irish and, for example, Greek and so on, you know. Because is the right and true pronunciation. You never know how much of this Buffon style is just for show. Don't think he's a bumbling idiot. Who are you talking about there? Sorry, Ryan. Uh, Kaiserism. The phone stands for sure. Don't think he's a bot. Sorry, who? Oh, are you talking about um, Trump? Oh, I didn't. I didn't say he's a bumbling idiot. I said he's not intelligent. There's a difference. Uh, I'll tell you something else. There's a massive difference between intelligence, education, wisdom, street smarts, 
all of the common sense, all of these things are not the same. Um, uh, there's a level of coming. But intellectual chops, he's got zero. Um, you know, I've, I've listened to the things that the man has said, and um, I just, um, unbelievable stupidity. Um, don't get me wrong, stupidity is something that I, I, you, you probably ask me what, if you ask me what stupid is, I'd, I'd probably give you a very different answer to what most people think stupid is. All sorts of people can be stupid. Stupid's not stupid's not uh, within the, the core of the uneducated or the, you know, highly most highly intelligent people I know are stupid as hell. Uh, it's 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 there's a what is stupidity if you think about it is kind of doing something when you already know that you shouldn't do it you know but um it's everybody's entitled to their opinion ryan it's just observation with me um but um uh i i would i would absolutely <laughs> but you see that's the kind of thing i do rub people up the wrong way and i'm not the sort of person you would ever put in a room with people like that because I can take them to pieces verbally. It's 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 so easy to do. Trump, I mean, how Trump goes on TV and portrays himself like that is just uh, his place in history is well written, and there are people like him in history as well. Blech, I have to. <laughs> um, but the, if if you took Trump uh, Herbert's warning, then you would say Her, Trump wasn't the word the warning, was he? Trump's the oh god, this is so bad. That we can't wait to get the next guy. That's the pro. Both the Barrett, that's the thing. The Harkonnens and the Atreides and June know this absolutely. They know how to manipulate people. They need a hero, don't they? Education does not prevent ignorance. It certainly does not. Put it this way: I, 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 this is something that I would say, Neo, is that I, I know an awful lot. I'm, I'm a guy that knows shit loads. But what I do not know fills the entire universe outside my head. <laughs> and that's an awful, awful lot. It's good to admit you're ignorant. Ignorance is simply the lack of knowledge. You either know something, you're either knowledgeable or you're ignorant. And ignorance is fine. It's it's acknowledging it and, and changing it, if you wish, I think. But it, no, education does not prevent ignorance at all. And we, we talked about Boris Johnson having been classically educated in a very particular way. That that's sophistry, by the way. That's a sophisticated in, individual. That's uh, that's uh, it's a he's a very bad advert for Eden, isn't he? Um, <laughs> uh, dear oh dear, the fact is we all share basically, yeah. Um, and uh, education being accessible. I'm I'm not the way I am because of Northern Ireland's education system. I'm I had to go through it, but I'm kind of the the way I am because I educated myself. Um, we all have hobbies and interests, and I, I, you know, life can be pretty much quite a drudge. And I figured if you're going to do, do what you like, stick to what you, uh, you know, you might not end up rich or famous, but happiness, I think, is a key to, to our individual experience in life. It's, it, and we're all unique, and we're all individuals. You know, as Christopher Hitchens said, it's not about intelligence, it's about how you use your mind. Yeah. Um. I get called arrogant a lot, and I get and I don't I don't bandy my intelligence about. Um, but I, I actually have, I think I've told a couple of you all through these conversations. I've actually had to spend a fair amount of my life pretending to be something I'm not, and, and in particular pretending to be stupid. Um, and, and for a lot of my school career, pretending to be stupid and having people treat you as stupid is part of it, I suppose. Hmm. But it's it, it's a bit insightful. In, in some ways, I was a barman for a long time. It's a bit like being a barman and watching everybody. You know, everybody on that side of the bar is drunk, and you're the only sober person. It's a bit like that. Um, happiness is of greater value than money or fame. Hide your power level is a smart strategy. It's a survival strategy. Right? <laughs> I get compared to Sheldon Cooper um, a lot. A few people that know me, but uh, they 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 put it. Uh, the last person did it put it a different way. Uh, different way that I was a bit like Sheldon Cooper if his mother had um, been involved with something like, I think it was Sherlock Holmes, Moriarty and <laughs> something like that is what I got and I'm not on the spectrum um, <laughs> but I'm just a very odd person um, and I don't, I don't have that kind of ego I'm, I'm, I know what I mean, I make mistakes and I can be incredibly stupid myself and have a long record of being stupid. But I, um, I'll, I'll tell you something. One of the things I would say that's, is, is worth seeking in life is, from my own point of view, I'm a bit of a philosopher, but 
um, there's a, 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 I always wanted to be wise. We talked about, oh, I want to be intelligent. I want to be educated. I want to be rich. Being wise is um, interesting. And then no, no, there's a level up above that, which is being sagacious. And the difference between wisdom and the difference be, uh, between wisdom and sagacious, and this is my own thing, is the difference between opening your mouth and shutting it. <laughs> if you understand what I mean. Uh, to be truly wise is to keep your mouth shut. <laughs> to be sagacious is to open it occasionally. Um, it's quite interesting. Christopher Hitchens, yeah, I think I think Christopher Hitchens has a fair few comments about Northern Ireland and, and the situation here, and, and his you know religion comments. Uh, he's a he's a great intellectual uh, debater. I'm sure he'll be sadly missed, um, not by a lot of people actually. I think his death kind of garnered a lot of hate, and that he's now in hell and stuff. I think Christopher Hitchens got one key thing wrong. Um, he's wrong about religion, and God. Uh, and I'll tell you why. Uh, if he rewrote the book and said money, he would have been right because religion and God subservient to that. If you look at all things in terms of systems, Frank Herbert would tell you about that tripod is the most unstable of political situations. Well, the way the world works at the minute is you've got money, you have religion, and you have government, power, democracy, whatever you want to call the process of politics. And all of those ones are subservient to money. They can't function without it. So money is a system that human beings have created that they can't get out of at the moment. And it's absolutely worthless. Um, and uh, But religion needs money. Government needs money. And all of you need money to live. Um, but if you ever if you ever notice, if you ever watch, go, uh, watch civilization go into a state of total war, then your money is worthless. And all you can really do with it is burn it for... Um, because you can't eat it, can you? So you can burn it for um, fuel. But it, it, see, money, money's a system. And uh, it's one of the things I teach my kids and when I'm tutoring is we show, we show them money. And I, I, I've explained to them that it isn't anything. It's a piece of paper and linen, and it promises to give you some silver if you take it to this, this building in Belfast. But uh, otherwise, it's an IOU, you know? So that's my own opinion. But um, he was charming and charismatic, agreed. He's, uh, Hell of, a, hell of an intellect, you know. Um, and I, again, I think he had quite, a, from, a, from a religious schooling point of view, uh, I think he had quite an abuse of sort of the, the people that educated him in a certain way. That, um, if you look at the concept of the cathedral, I would say a small bug. Hmm, I've always scribbled down on that. The cathedral, the chair. <laughs> then see a small bug. What's the name? Very alliterative. Yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, but I, I think Chris, Christopher Hitchens was kind of very much a pundit in America for a long time. So we didn't we didn't see too much over him, of him over here, except for the religious debates, I suppose. <clears throat> I wish you all a good night and even better start the week. I've got ahead of uh, Same to yourself, Ryan. Uh, all the very best. I think it's a good time to sort of call it an evening, folks, actually, because it's just gone about quarter past 12 here. So um, we will say good night to you as well. We'll wrap up. Let's just see. Uh, but take care, Ryan. Uh, government fiat currency is currently really a zero coupon perpetual bond and IOU, like you say. Yeah. And um, look what look what's happened to money at the moment. I think I think most governments' reactions to the COVID, whether they've been good or bad, um, if they've been in lockdown, they've come out of lockdown for money. Our country's certainly done that. Every we've gone in and out of lockdown every time, and it's to provide um, it's so that a certain group can make money. And it's interesting that with COVID here, we kind of have really, it's been it's been kind of been an interesting social exercise. But um, we're losing medicines here and stuff, all sorts of things, really because of the Brexit thing, you know. But um, yeah, I, I always think, if you look at Douglas Adams' concept of, uh, is it the Ningi and the Pew? Is it the, the currencies and the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? <coughs> I, I think you'd be better creating an economy based on happiness rather than a piece of metal that's actually worthless, you know. Um, quite interesting. 99% owned is an eye-opening documentary. Yeah, we thing we're talking about is the Adam Curtis documentaries. Folks, if you haven't seen any of them, they're, they're quite interesting. And how he pieces them together is from a lot of kind of unused footage from the BBC. And stuff. You'll find them on the BBC iPlayer, actually. Uh, has somebody spotted my Babel fish? <laughs> there you go. You see it? 
I'll stick that in my ear and I can understand anything. <laughs> Yo, know, Papa, I think the Lord's also made a document on Richard Warren's book, Princess of, Yen. Princess of Yen. Hmm. You guys are pretty well read, and it's, 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 good, it's good to see. It's uh, you're real, uh, giving me some stuff to look at. It's, it's, it's great. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's not really a <laughs> It's a thing for soy sauce, and I decided uh, to spray it orange, and there you go. That is my very own table fish. Just stick it in here. <laughs> uh, I'm a bit of a big Wayne in some ways. I don't know if you know what that means. Uh, uh, Wayne is a, it's a Northern Irish word, a big kid. Um, Adam Curtis's great power of nightmares knocked it out of the park. Did a great interview with the girls from the Red Scare. Um, yeah, a lot, I think a bunch of his stuff's on YouTube, but uh, some of it, more recent stuff's definitely on uh, on uh, on the BBC, I think. So yeah, Adam Curtis is excellent. Um, no, I, I do disagree with a lot of the stuff. I think was, there's a thing on about YouTube talking about how a lot of people live in their own heads these days. And I kind of disagreed with them because I've kind of always, as my, my wife would tell you, I live inside my own head, you know, lying in front of bulldozers. Though, absolutely not, no. Well, I, I could tell you a story, actually, Neil, with you, you, you probably wouldn't believe it. <laughs> yeah, no, we've had the bulldozers in. And they weren't wanted. And uh, yeah, <laughs> I could, I could, I could tell you all about the use of a Schrodinger's cat bomb if you like something. But uh, hmm, there we go, folks. Well, listen, I've enjoyed the chat, folks, very much. It's been all things science fiction. Yeah, yeah there's a few. We've moved the room about a wee bit just because our dogs usually down this end, and, and this is the dog house, by the way. We sleep, they sleep out here too. So. But we kind of my my office can be quite messy with folders and stuff, and this is the kind of acceptable bookshelf of uh, of science fictiony stuff before it goes a bit bonkers. <laughs> Don't forget your tile shelves. My tile's next door. Uh, I have a tile with forty two on it, and my wife bought it for me for my forty second birthday. And uh, yes, I, I seldom go anywhere without a tile. <laughs> and you you get your wisdom where you find it, don't you, gentlemen? And if you think it's daft, it's not. I think a like time is really handy. Do you not know that? <laughs> mm. Wet it for use in hand to hand combat, etc. <laughs> I'll, show, I'll show it to you the other day. It's just next door. Well, listen, folks, have a really good night. I will say good night. It's late here. And uh, uh, there'll be more tomorrow night. So we're just coming up to two hours of nattering. So that's pretty impressive, I think. And uh, I said tomorrow's got all the, all the interesting bit of tech from. Uh, from June with the uh, the Talalax, here we've got the Golas and the, the ex lotl tanks, which is always interesting, I think. And uh, and then, of course, uh, the artificial Milans. So, hello, Aqua Baby. I'm really sorry, Aqua Baby. We're just saying good night to everybody. <laughs> so, we're just about to hit the hay. But we will be back tomorrow, folks. Tomorrow is the next um, offer a pan galactic gargle blaster. Yes, indeed. Oh, the, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is wonderful. And if, if uh, I'll leave you with this thought, by the way. Um, Sean, Sean, have a wonderful night. The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is different in every form it exists in. So the radio is different than the TV is different than the book, than different than the film, which is something that's great about it. So I'm off for a pan-galactic gargle blaster, folks. Enjoy, uh, enjoy your evening very much, and uh, we'll see you tomorrow. And take care, and thank you for joining us. All the very best. Good night now.